Thank you so much. Total praise. May our lives, O oh Lord, praise you. May that be the case this morning. Good morning. Well, you know, for those of you uh, who were here a few weeks ago when I spoke last, you'd know that I was talking about the armor of God, and one of the illustrations that I used was I came out with my hockey bag that was full of dust and basically garbage, and it, and it stunk like you wouldn't believe, because I hadn't used it for seven or years. And, uh, and I told you about that. And I said, just like the armor of God needs to be put on each and every day, I think for me, I've got to get back to that, that playing hockey and getting that armor on. And someone in this congregation took that to heart. And uh, Richard Mason emailed me that week. And he said, you know, Mike, every Friday night I play hockey. Why don't you come and join me? And I thought, man, I got to practice what I preach now. And so what did I do? I actually vacuumed the bag and uh, cleaned up my gear. And uh, I've played for the last two Friday nights. I'm practicing when I'm preaching. And, um, and it's killing me, okay? I am, I am sore. There are muscles that I didn't even know existed in the human body. And uh, I have pulled every single one of them. But uh, just so excited. This morning, we're, we're going to be looking again into the book of Ephesians like we have been for the last several weeks. We're in a, in a study of the book of Ephesians together. This morning, the title of my message is Be Careful How You Live. Be Careful How You Live. We're going to be looking in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. You know, as, uh, as a child, I always looked up to my dad. Maybe some of you feel the same way. You, you looked up uh, to your father, you looked up to your mother, but one of the things that I would do when my, when my dad was in the bathroom getting ready each and every morning, as a little gaffer, I'd, I'd want to go in, and when he was shaving in particular, I'd always stand up on the, on the toilet, make sure the seat was down, stand on the toilet, and uh, I would get shaving cream on my face because there was just something about that. I just felt like such a man, you know, even as a three, four, five-year-old, just doing that. And, uh, you know, even now, my, my little man, Zane, he wants to put on the shaving cream like Dad. I just make sure the razors are very far away from him, if you know what I mean. But, you know, that, that was something that I always wanted to do. And, and then when my dad would fix the car, you know, he'd be, he'd be looking over the engine, and often what I'd do is I'd pull up a chair to peer over, or I'd stand on the bumper. That was when bumpers were actually made out of metal. Some of you may remember that you could actually stand on a bumper, and I would lean over the engine compartment, and one of the things I love to do, I'd find the most grease I could, the most dirt on that engine compartment, and I'd make sure I rubbed it all over me. I wanted it on my hands, I wanted it on my face, I wanted to look just like Dad. I wanted to be just like Dad, and you know what? In so many ways, I still do. There some characteristics and, and traits that my dad has that I so desperately want in my life. I think all of us at some point have wanted to be like a superhero. Kids want to, want to be like, like a superhero. They want to be like Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman. And, uh, you know, I would uh, I'd run around the, the house with just my underwear on and uh, a towel around my neck, you know, with a, with a pin. Yeah, how many of you used to do that? I mean, I still do that. I mean, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, my, my little boy Zane does that now. And, uh, or we want to be like pop culture figures. You know, um, growing up when I was a, a teenager, the, the rap scene, rap music was, was really, really big. And it was, it was really hitting the mainstream. And one of the groups that, that uh, got really big was a group by the name of Criss Cross. And, and uh, they used to sing, Criss Cross will make you jump, jump. The Daddy Mac will make you Jump, jump, and they had really good tunes. I missed the bus, and it was something I would never, never, never do again. Whoop, 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 whoop. And, uh, but that wasn't the cool thing about them. The cool thing was actually how they would wear their clothes backwards. So they would wear their pants backwards, all right, fly to the back. They would wear their shirts backwards. I mean, it was the trippiest thing, seeing people walk away from you, and it looked like they were walking towards you. And uh, crazy stuff, or, or vanilla ice, you know, ice, ice, baby. Ding, 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 ding. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the cool things about Vanilla Ice is uh, he, he, would, he would shave, you know, stuff into the side of his hair, and then he would shave his eyebrows. And I noticed young Ryan Donauder on guitar, he's done the same thing, and he doesn't realize it. It's just a throwback back in the day, 1990, right? And uh, we've, all done, we've all done crazy things trying to follow people or emulate people. You know, and, and I think all of us are, are trying to emulate people. You know, I still 
am trying to emulate or follow the example of other people. There, there are different business leaders that I want to emulate in my life where, where I say, you know what, some of the practices that they do are, are things that I want in my life. I want to follow that example. There are some spiritual leaders, some church leaders where I just look at them and I go, man, I want to be able to communicate effectively like they do. Just where, where I, I, I want the, the spirit of the Lord to flow through me. I want to be like them. I, I want to follow in their shoes. I think all of us want to follow the example of someone. Regardless of how old you are when push comes to shove, I think we can all agree that we all follow someone. We all follow someone. I mean, we, we like to think of ourselves as trailblazers. Some of us like to think of ourselves as, as blazing a trail where no one else has gone before. But the truth of the matter is not all of us can be Star Trekkies going where no one has gone before. Most of us are actually following in the footsteps or following the example of someone else who has blazed a trail before, someone else who has done something. And so we follow people in business. You know, you, you may be a business leader here and you're saying, you know what, if I could only only be like them, if I could only lead my company like them in the top 50, or, or perhaps you're a homemaker and you go over to someone else's home and it's like, why is it so clean that I can eat off the floors? I want to be like them. Or, or you go over to someone's house and, and they prepare a meal and you say, the only preparation that I can do is throwing a microwave dinner into the microwave. How is it that they are like Jamie Oliver or Martha Stewart? And why do they always have fresh roses around their house, right? And we want to be like that. We want to be like they are. And and then there are some of us who, who look at, at people with their political ideologies and we know that they're so wise and, and it seems like they've always got the right thing to say or the right quote. I mean, I'm on Twitter and, and sometimes the quotes that people can come off with or the smart things that they can say in 144 characters, I'm like, I want to be like that because my stuff is like, I'm hanging out. Like, I don't even know what to say. I, I just quit doing Twitter stuff. I just follow other people because I'm like, just, uh, I'm not cool enough. I, I want to be like the cool people that everyone else wants to retweet. You know, Mahatma Gandhi said, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Because when you actually want to be like someone, because you really think that what they have to offer is awesome, and, and when you try to emulate the things that they do and say, then, then really th that, is, that is quite a, a flattering thing. It's quite a flattering thing when someone else wants to be like you because they see something good in your life. Let me ask you this morning, is there someone that you've always wanted to be like? Is there someone that, that you really look up to? And what is the main reason that you would want to imitate their life? What is the main reason that you would actually want to be like them? When you take a care, careful look at your life, when you actually examine your life like you would examine a specimen under a microscope, what are you imitating in other people? Whom are you imitating and whose footsteps are you following? This morning, if you would turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, and I want us to take a look at the example that the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesians. And he says, if you want to follow anyone, here's who you should follow. So we read in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. He says this. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. The scripture is very clear for us this morning that the ultimate example that we are to follow as Christians is the example of God and to love like Christ has loved us. We're to follow the example of God and then to love as Christ has loved us. Well, how has Christ loved us? His love knows no bounds. It is absolutely boundless. He even went to the cross to die for our sins. This morning as we were singing the songs, so many of them focused on his sacrifice for us because really that's the crux of the Christian message. All about Christ in his great love, doing what only he could do, and that's to die in our place for our sins, for all the wrong that we have done. And that's his boundless love, even for people that hate him, even for people that will never embrace him. His love is so great that he would go to the cross for us. His love knows no bounds. So for, for Christians, Jesus is our ultimate measuring stick. He's the one that we're to strive to measure to. You know, it can be very easy for us to measure our lives against other people. 
What I find is when I'm measuring myself against other people, I always try to find people that I think are really in dire straits. Like, I'm doing pretty good as compared to a serial killer. Or I'm doing pretty good in my finances compared to the man who doesn't have a home and is living on the streets. I mean, let's be honest. For many of you, you don't even want to get a financial assessment done because you're afraid that they're just going to laugh at you. And one of the best things that we can hear when we go into financial assessment, we go, yeah, you know, I've only got this and, you know, I don't really have any savings. And you just love to hear this. You love, you love this. Well, really, you're not as bad as some people I meet with. And it's like, hallelujah. <laughs> Babe, did you hear that? We're not as bad as some. There are some that are worse. There are some that are worse off than us even. Can you believe it? You see, we often want to measure ourselves against people that are in worse position than we are because then it makes us look good. You know, if I want to show that I'm such an Adonis, I'm going to find someone that, that doesn't care about their body image at all and go, well, I'm doing okay. But if I, if I put myself next to some of the hulking figures that's here, it's kind of like, I look like a pipsqueak. You know, when you're measuring in, in class, you know, when you're a little kid, you never measure against the tall kid. You measure against the small kid, and you're like, oh, I'm way taller than you, right? You just love that. Such a good feeling. Such a good feeling. Who are you measuring yourself against? When you think about the way you live your life, is Jesus the example, or are you looking to the person next to you? Right now, maybe some of you, you've got people going through your mind, you're like, I'm, I'm doing okay. Pastor Mike, I'm doing okay. You're looking to the person next to you. I got to warn you. The next part of scripture that we're going to go through is really heavy. The Apostle Paul, he pulls no punches. He's talking to the church in Ephesus, and he pulls no punches whatsoever. We saw on the video during the news clip, the North Point News, we saw how we're supposed to get ready for battle, and you saw the guys shadow boxing. Right here, Paul is pulling no punches whatsoever. He is not shadow boxing. He is going straight for the jugular. He's actually grabbing the Ephesian church around the neck, and he's saying, please listen to me. And so I want us to do the very same thing, because let me assure you, as I was reading it, the only thing that I could, re could say is, ouch, ouch. And this is what Paul says. We pick it up in verse 3. He says, but among you, there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. If you recall from our study, if you've been here in the last few weeks, Ephesus was a wealthy city. It was a cosmopolitan city that was dominated by the worship of Artemis or Diana, the goddess of virginity and of childbearing. And bringing sacrifices to her was believed to bring you fertility and good sex. And so as a result, the city was chock full of prostitution and chock full of people who were very loose in their morality and their sexuality. They were very loose in the way that they would speak. Often what happens is when we're loose in our sexuality, the, the words that we speak, the thoughts that we have, the jokes that we tell, they all flow out of that, that stream. And that's how the Ephesian church was. Seems to me that it's very similar to the day and age we find ourselves in here in Edmonton, Alberta. We live in a very loose culture. We live in a very permissive culture. If you think about what happens on the television, when you think about what we can access at the internet, just with the stroke of a button, just in a, in a heartbeat, when we think about the fact that, that people are basically saying, hey, listen, as long as it makes you happy, just go for it. As long as you're not hurting anyone, just go for it. I want to tell you this morning it does hurt. Sin does hurt. It carries a consequence. It hurts you. It hurts your future. And it hurts the people around you. Not even a hint. That's what Paul says to the Ephesians. 
Not even a hint, not even a hint of sexual immorality, not even a hint of coarse talking or coarse jesting, not even a hint of any of those sins that, that come up and rear their ugly head, not even a hint, not even a bit. We say in our culture, it's all good, it's all good. You know, something goes bad, oh, it's all good, it's all good. I want to tell you this morning, it's not all good. There are a lot of things that we do that are not good and they're not healthy for us and they don't help us in our relationship with Christ. They don't bring us closer to God and we can't just sit around and say, it's all good because it's destroying us. And that's why Paul is so emphatic, not even a hint of sexual immorality. Seems to me that when it comes to living the way that Paul is talking about in terms of sexual immorality and impurity and greed and obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, we end up allowing these things into our lives. We just let them creep into our lives for one of two main reasons. There's probably a million reasons. But first of all, I think we want to blend in with our culture. We just want to blend in so much. Often it's so imperceptible we don't even realize it. If you've been reading with us through the Bible, each, each year we, we, we try to read through most of the Bible, and, and we just finished the book of Joshua. And Joshua is very emphatic with the Israelite people. He says, do not have anything to do with the idolatrous nations around you. They are going to bring you down. They are going to take your eyes off God. You're going to start serving their gods. Don't do it. Don't fall into the traps that they will lay for you. Don't do it. Have nothing to do with what they're up to. We read later in, in the Bible that bad company corrupts good character. See, the problem is we don't want to stand out in any way or be singled out because our behavior is different. You know, even for those people that say, well, I'm really different. You know, I, I love it. I love when I watch different teenagers or different adults, and it's like maybe they're all dressed the same, and they've got tattoos from head to toe, and they've got every kind of piercing and everything like that, and they go, I just want to be different. But you realize all 10 of their friends that they're with all look the same. And, and you know what? It's, there's nothing against that. If you want to get tattooed and you want to get all piercings, that's fine. I mean, the only reason that, that it really keeps me from it is I know I'd do something stupid. Like, I'd put something on me that would just be so idiotic. People would go, why did you do that? My kids would go, why did you do that? And I'd be like, I don't know. I was under pressure. We just want to blend in. We just want to look like everyone else. We don't want to be different. And so we find ourselves in this trash-talking culture. You know, every day we see it, like, on TV, any of the talk shows, any of the late-night talk shows, it's just all about trashing other people, making fun of them. All of our jokes are based upon putting people down. Have you ever noticed that? All of our jokes. That's just how we roll. Every joke is about making ourselves look good and trashing other people. We look at Twitter and we look at Facebook. I mean, people will say things on Twitter and Facebook they would never, ever say to someone if they were face-to-face -face with them. We just put people down. We're just in that kind of trash-talking, obscene culture. I mean, it, it used to be that, that in, in most workplaces, especially in an office, you would not drop an F-bomb. You would not swear like that. No, this is an office. It's protected. And now it's just like, yeah, whatever. Do anything. Do it in front of customers. It's no big deal. We're just that kind of culture, and we just continue to slide down, and I think we just want to blend in. You know, there are many jokes that we shouldn't forward on to people. There are many jokes that we shouldn't forward on and email on. And, and here's the deal. If you wouldn't tell the joke to Jesus, you probably shouldn't tell it to other people. And that's an ouch. That's an ouch for me. Because here's the deal. Jesus is here. You guys, Jesus is here. There is no place on planet Earth where Jesus isn't. His presence is everywhere. He's omnipresent. God is everywhere. And then if you're a Christian, Jesus inhabits you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ is with you. He goes with you wherever you go. So that means when you tell a coarse joke and you wouldn't tell it to Jesus, you are telling it to Jesus. Because he hears, he's there. And so that's why Paul is so strong. He's like, don't, don't do it. You see, as believers, we're called to a higher standard. But we want to blend in. Secondly, I, th I think we want our cake and eat it too. Sin for a season. You, you know, the bottom line is sin is enticing. And actually, quite frankly, sin is quite pleasurable. Let's be honest. If sin wasn't fun, no one would want to sin, right? Let's all, let's all be honest. If sin wasn't fun, at least for a season, at least for a little while, no one would want to do it. 
But sin can be fun for a season. Sin can actually just just get us going. It can get our adrenaline pumping. It can just get us thinking like, whoa, can you believe we're going to do this? I mean, can you remember like as a kid just knowing you're going to do something bad and your heart's just a boom, 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 boom. And you're just like, whoa, this is awesome. I hope we don't get caught. And yet we do the same thing as adults. It's like, oh man, I'm going to sleep with her and she's not my wife. Oh, this is going to be awesome. I hope I don't get caught. Sin for a season, it's good. But I got to tell you right now, it has consequences. And it catches up. It catches up with us. You might be an adrenaline junkie and it might fulfill that, but when your adrenaline pops down, you are going to feel terrible. You're going to know I missed the mark. And the problem with many of us as believers is that we've got this false notion that we can just come to God anytime, we just ask forgiveness, then we just live however we want, and we can always come back and we just ask forgiveness, and live however we want and ask forgiveness. You guys, that's not how we live. That's not how we're supposed to live. You see, as followers of Jesus, we're called to think differently. We're called to think differently about issues of the world. We're called to think differently about sin. And then even greater than that, we're called to act differently. We should be acting differently. The things that we do, the things that we say, the things that we think should should more properly reflect Jesus, should more properly reflect God in us. Why is that so? Paul goes on to say this to his Ephesian hearers and to us today. He says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You see, Paul says positionally, he says, you were once darkness. You see, at one time, all of us, we were once darkness. We lived in sin. We didn't know the truth. We didn't know about God's goodness and his righteousness and his truth. And we just lived to satisfy our cravings and satisfy our desires. And we would do anything we could just to fulfill that. We lived in darkness. And yet Paul says, you once were there, but now you are light. You are light. Now, in the Lord, you are light. Positionally, you've changed. Once darkness. You were once there. But he says, you're not there anymore. Now you're light in the Lord. And he says, live as children of light. Live as people who are actually living in the light. Live as people who know about God's goodness and his righteousness and his truth. Don't live in darkness anymore. Live like you know how to live in goodness and righteousness and truth. I see the challenge for us is to live that way. There's a man by the name of Joseph Leake. He was a Brit. And uh, when he died... His estate donated $1.8 million to a society that helps provide dogs for the blind. Now, here's the interesting thing. No one knew that he had any money. He died at the age of 90. and He lived in the most shabby home you could ever see. He never spent any money on repairs on that home. He never spent any money on clothes. His clothes were so shabby and stinky and and always secondhand, never had a piece of new clothing. And in fact, he would even go to his next door neighbor to watch TV because he didn't want to spend money on electricity. And that's the truth. That That is the truth. That's how he lived. And when he was 90 years old and he finally died, which is probably because of his his poor diet. I can't believe he even lived to 90. $1.8 million he was able to give away to charity. Now, for many of you, you're thinking, that is crazy. And you know what? I think it's crazy. I think it's crazy that he, he lived like such a pauper. I think it's crazy that he was, he was trying to bum electricity off everyone else because he didn't want to spend the money himself. But you know what? Like the rich person that lives in utter poverty on purpose... 
is like the Christian who lives in darkness, who lives just to satisfy their appetites, who lives without really recognizing the truth of God. Because Paul says, you are light now. Why would you live there? Why would, you, why would you live in darkness when you live in light? Why would you live in darkness when God has already shown you his goodness, his righteousness, and his truth? Don't do that anymore. You see, our lives are meant to reflect the goodness, righteousness, and truth of God. We are the light of the world. Not only do we reflect the light, we are the light of the world. And sometimes we don't know, well, what is good and what is right and what is true? And Paul even says to them, he says, test it out. If you don't know what to do, if you're not sure what decision to make, if you're not sure how to actually proceed in any given situation, he says, test it. Ask God. And, and the words that he uses there are, are the same kind of connotation as how you would test metal, how you would put it through the fire and you would decide whether it's pure or impure, whether, whether it is what it says it is. And so in the same way, we need to take the word of God and we need to say, is it right? Is it just? Is it true? Is it good? Is what I'm doing, does it, does it fall into those categories? We need to search things out and test them out because as Christians, we don't live in the darkness anymore. We don't have an excuse. God's truth has come upon us and now we've got to live out that truth on a daily basis. And if you don't know what that truth is, you've got to test it. You've got to search it out with all of your heart. You see, our call is to expose the darkness with light. I've been so surprised that, you know, I've, I've, I've hung around different people, and, and just by being the light of the world, it's amazing how it exposes darkness. You know, when you're around someone and they're, talk, they're trash-talking someone else, or, or they begin to, they begin to uh, um, say things about someone else you know is not true, and just by being there and you say, you know what, can we just talk about something else? Or you say, I, I don't think that's really how they are. It's amazing how that light, that light that you shine, it's amazing how it extinguishes the darkness. All of a sudden people are going, uh, yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't mean what I said. It's amazing how that light, it just dissipates the darkness. You see, in the darkness, all sorts of sin can grow and it can fester and it can get bigger and bigger and bigger. But when the light of Christ comes, it exposes all of that for what it is, just lies. Just, just a fake. You know, Paul even goes on and he says to the people, he says, you know what? Don't even, don't even talk about the things that people do in the dark. Don't even, don't even mention the things that people do in the dark. You know, because when we do that, all we're doing is we're advertising for it. All we're doing is we're advertising sin. It, we're basically like Times Square and we're just advertising sin. The more we talk about it, the more we just advertise it and put it out there. And Paul says, you know what? Talk about goodness. Talk about righteousness. Talk about truth. Let those values go out. Let those things extinguish the darkness. Don't even talk about the darkness. You know, in 19... 88, I remember when Martin Scorsese made The Last Temptation of Christ, the movie. And the, the Christian community was in an uproar, and probably for a good reason. I mean, it, it wasn't a right portrayal of Jesus, and, and it had some very, very bad things in it, and it had some things that really warped what the, what the essence of the gospel is. But you know what? I really think that it was the Christians who, in talking about it all the time, and in really drawing light to it and saying, can you believe that? Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Then all of a sudden people said, oh, maybe we should go see that movie. And Paul would say, you know what? Don't even talk about that. Don't even talk about what people do in darkness. Live is light. Live is light. Now, I just want to put out a caveat right here. We are to have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness. Paul is very clear about that. Nothing to do with the deeds of darkness. But he talks about deeds, not people. You see, we need to reach people who are in darkness. That's what our call is at North Point Community Church. We want to reach people who are in darkness. We want to reach people who just don't even realize what life can really be like. That's why we are so excited and we put out the red balloons because when people make a choice to step into the light, we want to celebrate that. And so I want to tell you right now, we need to be around people who don't know Jesus. We need to go where they go because that's what Jesus did. 
But when we go there, we don't, need to, we don't need to do the things they did. We don't need to think the way they think. We don't need to speak the way they speak or do the things they do. No, we need to let the light of the Lord expose that for what it is. A lie and a sham where people say, I want the light more than I want the darkness. And so Paul finishes up in verse 15. He says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he says, do not be drunk with wine. The culture that the, the Ephesians were a part of was, was a a culture that would just get absolutely jacked up on alcohol. And, and then because of the, the goddess Artemis, the goddess Diana, and, and all of the fertility rites, they would go and they would do shameful things in their drunkenness and in their stupor. And Paul says to the people in the church at Ephesus, he says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't do the things that the other people do. Don't lose control of yourself. Be self-controlled. Instead, he says, so that's the negative. Don't do what they're doing. And he says, Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And, and it carries this, this sense, be filled continually, over and over on a daily basis, be filled with the Spirit. And for us, all we have to do is we, we ask. On a daily basis, I say, Lord Jesus, fill me. Come, Holy Spirit, fill me. Because in the end, I want to follow the example of Christ. I want to walk in step with the Spirit of God. Wherever the Spirit would lead me, those are the footsteps that I want to follow in. I want to follow in the steps of God. I want to be like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will help me in that quest. And the things that I, that I want in, in, in being drunk with wine and wanting that exhilaration that comes from that and, and in wanting that, that sheer joy that comes from being drunk with wine and making merry with everyone else, really what the Spirit of the Lord can do is bring a real and a true exhilaration, one that does not carry a consequence of being hung over, but one that says, oh Lord God, you are good and this is what life's all about. I love the day of Pentecost. We read in the book of Acts that when the Holy Spirit came and filled the people, they were so full of joy, everyone thought they were drunk. Everyone thought they were hammered. But it was the joy of the Lord that was their strength. It was the joy of the Lord. They were following in the footsteps of God. When Paul and Silas were preaching the word of God in Philippi and they get thrown in jail, here they are in this Philippian jail and they're probably in wooden stocks and yet late at night they are singing unto God. And I can only imagine that the Philippian jailer thought they are out of their minds, but they had tapped into a source. They had tapped into the Holy Spirit, no matter what their circumstance. They said, we know what true joy, we know what true fulfillment is. We know what it's like to have a real high. You don't have to get it from drugs. You don't have to fill up with food. We do all sorts of things. We want to fill our appetites and one of the things we do even as Christians, we just fill up with as much food as we can. We, we, we fill up with the things that we think we can get away with. We, we fill up with TV shows we know we really shouldn't watch, but we fill up, we fill up, we fill up, and we, and we just try to get a hint in. And Paul says, don't do it. Be filled with the Spirit instead. Be filled with the Spirit. So let me ask you this morning, what are you filling up with? What are you filling up with? Are you filling up with just the regular? With what you've been filling up with for years and years and years? Are you filling up with sin? Are you just, are you, are you taking care of the appetites that you've had your whole life? The appetites that you would, you would engage in when you were living in darkness? Do you continue to feed your soul and your body with all those things? Or have you decided that you're going to go to the premium pump? Have you decided that you're going to go to the Spirit and you're going to say, Come Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to walk in the steps of Jesus. Help me to follow the example of Jesus. The clarion call this morning from Paul is be careful how you live. Be careful how you live. It's so easy for us to live on autopilot. It's so easy to go through the motions of the day that we don't even realize how we're blending in. 
We don't even realize how we're eating our, having our cake and eating it too. We don't realize we're living in darkness when we should be living in the marvelous light of God. So this week, let's try to be aware of the things we do and say and think. Are we careful how we live? Are we imitating God or are we imitating darkness? Let's ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit each and every day. And the challenge this morning for you as we leave is that we would think different and that we would act different. Would you bow your heads? Some of you have heard me speak and something is going on in your heart and you're saying, Mike, I am living in darkness right now and I want to live in God's light. I want to live in his light. I want to be light. And you would say, I've heard the songs. I've heard all about Jesus, how he died in my place, how he died for every sin, that it was crucified to the cross. And then if I will just believe him, if I will ask him forgiveness, he will cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. And Mike, I want that today. I want to go from darkness into God's goodness, righteousness, truth, and light. And if that's you this morning, I'd just like you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Just like the people that did who have the red balloons up here, I want to pray for you. Yes? Anyone else? Yes, yes. Anyone else? One more time. Yes. And I want to pray for each one of us that God would be doing his filling in our lives continually. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for those that have raised their hand. Lord, those that have said, I want to step from darkness into light, and I pray that you would help them to live in the light and to walk in the light. Lord, cleanse them right now. And Jesus, I just pray that they would know that you now inhabit them. Lord, that you are right inside of them, Lord. And I pray that they would live for you and they would learn from you all the days of their life. And now for each one of us, Lord, that have known you for a long time, God, if we've been blending in, if we've been having our cake and eating it too, if we've been just trying to have a little hint of darkness, God, right now I pray to cleanse us. And Jesus, I pray that we would make that choice today, that we'd be filled with you rather, with, rather than with the garbage of this world. Lord, be with us. We pray these things, Lord, in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you made that decision, if you wanted to step from darkness to light, we would really love for you to take a welcome card. And would you just fill that out and just say, I asked Jesus into my life today. Put your name down there. We want to celebrate with you. We want, we want to put up some balloons. We want to help you in your journey. You can just fill that out and you can, you can put it in to the uh, info desk. We would really appreciate that if you would do that. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. May the Spirit of the Lord go with you, and may you be filled with the Spirit on a daily basis. Lord bless you.